Nova York, um em Moscou, um em Nova Delhi e um em Tóquio. E essa rede de centros está hoje dentro do DAD. O DAD é o Serviço Alemão de Intercâmbio Acadêmico. E nós somos uma organização que representa as instituições do ensino superior na Alemanha. E nosso objetivo é de promover a internacionalização dos estudos superiores no mundo inteiro. O encontro das pessoas, dos grupos de pesquisadores, das universidades é muito importante e isso é uma base da nossa cooperação com o Brasil mesmo. A cooperação entre duas comunidades científicas é muito produtiva, em geral causando impactos sempre maiores do que iniciativas de pesquisa feitas isoladamente. A DVRA, como a sociedade científica aqui, que tem uma ciência de excelência absoluta e alta tecnologia, é extremamente proveitosa essas parcerias. E a parceria entre o setor privado e o mundo científico é fundamental para promover as relações bilaterais. Hello, good morning Brazil, good afternoon Germany, hello everybody around the world that could be online with us today. Welcome to our second TV Half São Paulo online talk, surviving, living and shaping the future in the time of COVID-19. My name is Marcio Weichert, I am the program manager of the German Center for Research and Innovation in São Paulo. Before we start, I need to inform you that this online talk is being recorded, including the chat conversation. The recorded video will be published later on our YouTube channel. By participating in the event and chat, it means that you authorize us to record and publish the material. Your personal data that you use to log in will be deleted from our database at the end of this transmission and won't be used for marketing or other proposals. If you wish to be updated with the latest German-Brazilian scientific events, follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook. So, to open this, call, this talk today, I want to invite our director, Dr. Johann Hermann, who is also director of DED, the German Academic Action Service in Brazil, to welcome you all. John. Yeah, hello, Marcio, hello, everybody. Um, I promise you to be extremely brief um, because it is not, uh, we do not want to wait too long for the presentations, which are, of course, uh, much more interesting than that what I can tell you. Marcio already mentioned that we. Um, organized this series of talks um, as, a, as our uh, DWIH, this, which is the German abbreviation of the Center, the German Center for Research and Innovation in Sao Paulo. And uh, we have seen in the short introduction film what the German Centers for Research and Innovation are about. We are, our main mission, of course, is to foster scientific uh, um, cooperation between, especially between Brazil and uh, Germany, and uh, within this uh, the, this overall mission, our uh, normal um, uh, work is to organize 20 or more events every year um, to bring together researchers from Germany and from Brazil. But to be frank, to be sincere. I don't tell you anything uh, anything new when I stress that 2020, the current year, is really um, a horrible year, absolutely devastating, um, because of the COVID pandemic, of course, uh, which um, not only um, uh, has 
a very big and uh, especially serious impact on the health and the economic situation of so many countries. But for our um, nation, it is devastating in the sense that it renders practically imposs impossible to organize, present um, uh, uh, meetings where real people meet in real situations. And this is absolutely um, negative um, because the scientific cooperation is initiated, uh, especially the international cooperation is initiated uh, frequently by the personal contact between researchers and scientists uh, who have to build up a, um, a relationship of confidence which is not easily uh, substituted. But to, to see also the bright side of life, which is always a good thing, a good attitude to adopt, we have all, as all of us have learned in the last uh, month, uh, to manage tools such as the tool we are using now, online events. So, as Mar Marcio already mentioned, the meeting today is organized within the framework of a series of uh, online talks uh, under the topic Surviving, Living and Shaping the Future in the Time of uh, COVID-19. And uh, th these are the three um, main uh, aspects of the pandemic. How do we survive? This is, of course, uh, a, a priority. Uh, then how to live with, uh, with the COVID and what have and shall we do to prepare the future with or without the COVID, but future there will be. And so we should be prepared um, to um, see what, what it brings and what we have to do to be um, prepared. Between August and November, we host several uh, events under this same topic. And today, it is, of course, uh, living under the pandemic. We have uh, Professor Susanne Möbus from the Institute for Urban Public Health of the University uh, Duisburg-Essen. And we have uh, Jessica Farias, who is a PhD candidate in the social work, social and work psychology department of the University of Brasilia. You see that it's always our policy to bring together scientists from Germany and from Brazil and uh, have so uh, by this means uh, to uh, have the double perspective of a bilateral international um, scientific discussion. What we are especially curious about is to know uh, how will the disease uh, affect different groups within the uh, population? And I mean, uh, what are the factors that improve health in cities? We are all, most, most of us, we are city dwellers. And so, um, the urban population is, of course, um, um, especially concerned. Um, I think Professor Susanne Möbus will give us some answers to this question. What, what kind of health-improving measures should we adopt? Professor Möbus, we, we are all curious to learn a little bit about, about that. And as far as uh, Jessica Farias is uh, concerned, we, uh, I know that she has uh, uh, organized and um, carried out a study um, in order to better understand social distancing measures. And especially uh, the, questions is, the question is, um, what are the factors that influence the acceptance of social distancing and which social economic elements um, can contribute, uh, can, can constitute risk or per perhaps uh, support? Uh, and of course, Jessica, we want to know how can psychological support uh, a company foster uh, a responsible behavior. These are the elements um, uh, we are, I'm, I, I think we will discuss about. Uh, the interesting fact of all this is that we are all personally concerned because nobody, this is not uh, abstract uh, um, ivory tower discussion, but this is, these are questions which everyone um, is, has to deal with 
in our everyday life. And I think science, which can contribute to better understand the everyday life questions uh, we are confronted with, is uh, science promotion at its, at its best. So I thank you very much to, but, uh, to, to be here. And um, I give the, um, the floor is to um, Marcos, our moderator, I think. Johan, thank you very much. Uh, so before we hand over to our moderate, uh, uh, I have some notifications. During the event, we will conduct a short uh, surveys with you um, to have an idea about the profile of our audience and to hear your opinion about the event. Now, you can see the first survey. Two questions appear on screen. We will appreciate it if you answer them. They will stay open for one minute. We want to know if you already know our German center, the VH São Paulo, and uh, where you live or where you are. No, that's not the question. So, where you, where you are, and uh, what are your professional activities? In the chat, you can complete the question, informing your city, please. You are very curious to know in which city or country you are. So you can inform as well in the chat how you know uh, about uh, this event as well. Claude uh, is from Vienna, it's in Vienna in Germany. Fine. Papespi, the newsletter from Papespi works. Ever. Thank you, the time is up for this first survey. So just uh, to let you know that uh, the second part of the survey will be presented to you after the presentations of our both speakers today. At the end of the event, uh, you will have more time to complete the survey if you need. So it's time to hear our invited speakers, Professor Susanne Mürk from the University of Duisburg Athens and Jessica Farias from the University of Brasilia. Both of them will share with us interesting aspects about life, public health, social inequality and behaviors during the necessary isolation to block the pandemic expansion. To introduce them, I want to invite once more the chair of this one-line online talk, Professor Markus Berkovich, Director of the Institute of Biosciences at University of Sao Paulo, USP. As our invited speakers, Markus is currently very engaged in research actions about the new coronavirus and COVID-19. Please, Markus, the web... Thank you, Marcio. Uh, <coughs> Thank you all. I think Marcio and Jochen gave uh, very good introductions about, uh, about the subject we are going to talk today. This event is a follow-up of the first event uh, that was about uh, the, 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 the substances that could interfere with the diseases and how the disease work and vaccines that we did uh, then in the, this first event. Today, we discuss more the aspects related to the social behavior uh, the public health and the social inequality during the quarantine. Uh, I would like to introduce first Professor Susanne Möbius. Uh, she is director of the newly founded Institute for Urban Public Health at the University Hospital of the University of Duisburg, Essen. Uh, Professor Möbius holds a PhD in biology from the University of Bremen. Uh, and a Master of uh, Public Health from the University of uh, Bielefeld uh, in Germany. Uh, 
she teaches clinical environmental medicine and epidemiology to, med, uh, to medical students at the university clinics of Essen and several graduate seminars to master students uh, at the University of Duisburg Essen. Besides urban epi epidemiology, uh, her research interests include diverse aspects of urban public health, such as acoustic quality and built environment, built environment, green and mental health, uh, and mental health. Uh, she has been involved in several research and development uh, projects uh, funded by the, the European Union, the German Research Foundation. And number the German uh, Research Foundation and numerous uh, other public and private funding bodies. Uh, she has published uh, widely in international peer-reviewed journals. Uh, Professor Mobius is a member of several large national and international research consortia uh, and sits on the board of the German Society for uh, Social Medicine and Prevention as well as the Use and Access Committee of the German National Cohort and the, editorial and, and the Editorial Advisory Board of Research for the, for the Journal of uh, Complementary and Classical Natural Medicine. So, Professor, uh, Professor uh, Mobius, uh, I will give you now the floor. You have uh, 15 minutes for a presentation. And then I'll, I'll, I'll present uh, Jessica Farias. She will also have 15 minutes of presentations and then we start the, the discussion just after the, the Yes, statistics. thank you uh, uh, very much uh, to Markus and Jochen for this very nice introduction, although it's mostly too long for, or from my side. I think it's uh, such an important and such an exciting topic that we are discussing today. Uh, so that, that we need a lot of time to, to talk about that. And uh, my topic today is the crisis from the view of urban public health in Germany. And I think, uh, I was thinking, how can I just uh, give you some insights? What is the impact of uh, uh, the, the, the COVID, the crisis on, on, on the people living in cities, mostly in cities? And I thought, no, probably it's, more, um, it's better to start with some basic things. So what 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 about what is public health? What, what is our, what are our views and what are the basic concepts? And when telling you these concepts, I hope that you might find the links to COVID nineteen at once. So my my point is that I don't want to talk directly. This is doing the COVID is doing this to the people and that to these people. It's more about that everything when we are talking about um, public health is doesn't change so much if it's COVID or if it uh, other kinds of diseases or when it comes to health. So in, uh, in that way, I think it's perfect that I can start with that and Jessica will then will come get, gets down more deeply in, uh, in one of these examples. So for me, it's, it, it's nice to see that in that way. So just start, I would give you at least a view of some pictures how the situation of COVID is in, in Germany, some just pictures. And I think every one of you knows these kinds of pictures when it came to the lockdown, the, the discussion about are there enough uh, hospital beds and about if, are there enough uh, test centers. And of course, in Germany, it was very uh, uh, interesting that uh, in, in Europe, even the, the borders that were open before now closed down. And of course, everything else was closed down here in Germany. And also, of course, you know, these pictures after the lockdown uh, slowly um, uh, disappeared in Germany. We had the picture now in the public that everyone is wearing a mask. In, in when you go shopping or uh, even the small children are, are, are wearing it and in open public transport. So this is one of the pictures that we now have in our cities. And uh, of course, you know that uh, there are already um, some uh, now that people are get tired from these separating each other. So even the youth is now doing celebrating in good summertime, they like, they like to go out and so on and so on. And of course, we also have the problem of people that are denying this kind of 
co uh, coronavirus and because of totally different uh, reasons but what makes it very inter not interesting but but it just it, uh, it phrased me uh, that that also the right wing parties take part of that and take to take part over to these kinds of critics however this is not the main point these are just some pictures and of course the children were heavily affected because their the institution were closed the the playgrounds were closed and now in the schools they also mostly affected because they couldn't go to school now they can go to school but they have to wear the mask and even the small kids so this is lots of discussion discussion and you see it, it goes through all kinds of life when when it comes to the the, the effects of this virus now um now I, I start with the basic points to understand why I think when we are thinking about what effects and who is affected by the coronavirus, I think it's not only they are not only affected by the coronavirus, but it's more general view. And first of all, just to, to tell you what is public health and the public health approach is asking is, is looking at population groups. And uh, they are asking why so many people are getting sick or getting this kind of heart attack. On the other hand, which is mostly more familiar to us, is the medical, the clinical approach. And that one is asking why does this patient does get this heart attack? So you see, these are totally different questions. And of course, you also come to different kinds of conclusions. Uh, so yeah, this, this we run through. And urban public health here is just that, of course, we now have the perspective of urban uh, environments of uh, of cities. And then we are asking also, have you ever thought about how the way we design and build our communities can affect our health? So this is one of our main questions we have when it comes to urban public health. And one of the basic things is that health is a human right. This is often forgotten. So of course, yeah, health is important. No, it's even a human right. And what else is very important that it's basic for a sustainable development. And we are talking about uh, sustainable uh, development and the WHO made these things. It said health is a basic, basic human right and essential for social economic development. And this is a declaration which has been signed from almost all countries all over the world. So it's one of the basic th things. And on the other hand, it's uh, that, of course, we have the discussion about urban uh, sustainable development. Uh, let's see. No, it's, it's gone. However, uh, so what we can see is a sustainable development is a healthy development. And on the other hand, vice versa, it's, of course, you need a healthy development to get a sustainable development. This is very important as one of these basic where we are dealing when it comes to changes or to, to think about how can we improve the situation of health and so on. So, but what is about health? Mostly when we are talking about health, we think, we think of health mostly when we are sick, to be honest. And so when it comes to the definition of health, I think we can talk month or even years about what is the right definition for health. It's very difficult. And I, of course, I don't want to do you know, all of these definitions, but I would, would give you some examples how the thinking when it comes to urban public health or public health, the thinking, some ex, uh, just an example to make clear what I mean. So there is a majesty government, so the health officer, sorry for these uh, things, it doesn't work that well, but, but just I think it's clear. There is the chief medical officers of the United Kingdom, he published once 10 tips for a better health. And these 10 tips, when I show you to them, you probably know them at once. So don't smoke if you can't stop and follow a better balanced diet physical activity, stress, alcohol, and so on and so on. I probably you know these kinds of, of points where you know, okay, I have to do these things to stay healthy. This is evidence-based, and so these tips, tips are not bad. However, there are also some alternative tips for better health. And looking at these ones, you will see these are quite different. These are about don't be poor. If you're poor, try to be not for too long. 
don't live in a deprived area, don't be a disabled or have a disabled child, don't work in a stressful low paid manual, don't live in low quality housing, and so on and so on. Also, all aspects that are totally different from those 10 tips, what you have seen before. And also, these kinds of tips are also evidence-based. So there is lots of scientific literature that shows and research that shows the, the, the uh, association between these, um, these points, social points, and health. And to make it very clear, both sides are important and evidence-based, but they answer different things, and we have also Keep in mind that these things are very important for health. Why is it like this? Because we can also say, if you look at health on a more global scale and to see what are the influence and factors, what, what, what affects health and the other way around, we see here in the middle the people with the age, sex and, and so on, but we see also lifestyle, community, local economy. And then, then we see also the natural environment, built environment, and so on, and of course, even the global ecosystem. And you see all these parameters, all these aspects, all these rooms, they do affect health and the other way around, of course. And this is a different view from just saying, I'm healthy or I'm sick. And so there is the word, or this is why we also define health as created. So it's created and it's lived by people within the settings of their everyday life. There is where health is going to be made. So there where they learn, where they work, where they play, and there where they love. So you see this is a bit different just than just saying, oh, my temperature is high, or I have a cough or something like that. And if I don't have a cough, I'm, I'm unhealthy. So it's a different kind of health model, which will be important to show you. Because also, there is not a dichotomous aspect, I'm healthy or I'm sick. No, we understand health and disease in a more continuous way. So the people, the human being, beings, are somehow oscillating between very healthy and, and ill illness. So you never, are, you, you, you are not only ill, even if you are ill, you ha might have some uh, healthy as experts and you might be very healthy although you might have also phases where you are ill and so on and so on you see so somehow we are moving inside this this uh, uh, continuum and the basic requirements for health and this is why it's important to understand why covid affects especially those deprived areas and pe people that are m mainly deprived the fundamental condition and resource for health are peace, shelter, education, food, income, a stable ecosystem, and so on and so on. So these are things that influences much the health of our people. And then is the, one of the last slides I will show you, and this slide is where I think it makes it very clear. So an individual has a, a number of health hazards. And the more health hazards he has, also from poverty, poor housing, unemployment, food and nutrition, and so on and so on, to poor neighborhoods, you know, the more he has all these external um, health hazards, the more it's for this individual to stay to stay healthy or to keep these individual lifestyles, for instance, in a healthy way. So this is why we also have to concentrate on these things to say we must give the people the best choice to, to, uh, uh, for them to stay healthy, okay? So in this way, I can tell you without knowing anyone who's living where that in these places, the chance to have a high, uh, the, the, the risk to, to get sick by diabetes or whatever is higher than in this kind of area, although they are very close by, that doesn't mean that no one is sick here or everyone is sick here. No, that's not the way, but the risk is higher when you're living in a more deprived area than in a more healthy area. That's it. So one of the things is what we need is we need, be, uh, we need to build a healthy public policy, which we call health in all policy. 
So health promotion goes beyond health care. When we are talking about health, and even if we are talking about what are the effects of COVID on health of the people, then we have to think not only do we have enough beds, do we have enough hospitals and stuff like that, do we have enough testing capacity. Now, we also need where are these people living? Do they have the possibility to go outside even in lockdown situation? Do they have fresh air? Do they have a good network? And so on and so on. These are the questions that we have to answer and to look at. And there are already lots of tools and checklists like building healthy places or even the healthy built environment checklist and where you can have a look inside and, and, and get some more ideas how to tackle these things. It's just to, you might have a look afterwards. And in this way, I'm already already uh, finished. I hopefully not too not in a, uh, in the Brazilian 15 minutes. But my general and key question could be that we might discuss even with the situation also in Brazil and here in Germany, which potentials for a healthy urban development are open by the experience of a lockdown. So what I said, do we need, did everyone has enough public space, green space to go and to get some more um, when it's, there's a lockdown? How can we, how can we design that? How can urban development ensure that the crisis that does not increase inequality, inequality what we see right now? Because the poorer people or the poorer children that have not the, uh, the, 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 the equipment and home to get homeschooling, they have no even a less chance to get a good uh, education. Um, we, we can skip this here. And how can we organize and design our cities for the future? From the experience of our cooperation between different sectors during the corona crisis, we have seen that everyone, each public sector and each politics, if politics sectors now is dealing with health and they have to cooperate. And how can we keep this also after the corona crisis? Because this is very important to have something like that so that there is a collaboration for the future. And of course, there are lots of lots of more of these questions, but hopefully you have now something in mind that the coronavirus is not very special or special when it comes to health and disease. It's the same before the corona crisis and after the corona crisis. So we have to look at that in the whole. And if we understand the basic and if we understand that disease or health is not just the absence of disease, then probably we can see it in a in a broad way and, and understand who whom do we have to help and where have we designed better cities. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, I'm I'm really thank you Professor Suzanne. Uh, I will now introduce uh, our next speaker. Uh, that is Jessica Farias. Uh, Jessica has a master's degree and is a PhD candidate. Uh, I believe she's a PhD student in the social in, in social work and psychology department of the University of Brasilia. Uh, her research interests are concentrated uh, on on the fields of social influence, uh, group behavior, social cognition and cross-cultural psychology, including topics such as dishonest behavior, corruption, the so-called jeitinho in Brazil, social norms, uh, group decision-making, and, and group influence. Uh, I, I will now pass the, the, the word to Jessica. Uh, you have 15 minutes to do your presentation, Jessica. I believe you have to open your microphone and your camera, Jessica. Hello, everyone. 
so today I'm going to be talking about a research that I have conducted during the pandemic. Uh, the research main objective was to investigate which factors would influence compliance with social distancing measures. Jessica, can you so the camera on? Okay, can, can you see me now? Yes, we can see you All now. All right, so as I was... Okay, good. So uh, I have conducted the research during the pandemic, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, in late, late March and early April. And uh, I wanted to investigate which factors would influence compliance with social distancing. And so um, I wanted to invest investigate the questions of, and some possible effect of some variables, such as political polarization, income, professional status, and social norms and intolerance of uncertainty on compliance with social distancing. Okay, so the first variable that I'm going to be talking about is political partisanship. And uh, interesting, interestingly, um, in countries such as the United States and, and Brazil, the presidents who are both right-wing supporters, they have not showed support to uh, COVID prevention measures in the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, research has show, uh, shown that political affiliations in influence attitudes, judgments, and behaviors. And there is evidence on political polarization around the COVID pandemic in, in other countries as well. Uh, I want to know if you can all hear me. I'm not sure. Yes, we can hear you. You can go ahead. Yeah. 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 We can see you. We can, see, you. We well, can right? see the presentation and we can hear you okay. well. Okay, good. All right, so we have found uh, there is also some research showing that there is evidence on polarization in, in countries such as the United States and the UK. And uh, also some research, they uh, point out that authority figures elicit compliance. So considering the influence of political leaders, so, uh, like in the United States and in Brazil, in their position in the beginning of the pandemic, it could be expected that people who are supporters of the presidents in both countries would be more prone to violating social distancing. And also right-wing supporters would be more prone to violating it because both presidents are conservative and right-wing politicians. Okay, and another variable that was investigated in the realm, realm this, of this research was uh, income. So Brazil is a highly unequal country. In the year of 2018, uh, the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics um, mentioned, you know, released some data saying that in, um, in, in Brazil, about 1% of the richest people earned al almost 34 times more than they have first. And that five, about 5% 5 of the population earned 51 reais per month which is about $10, uh, approximately half of Brazilians, they earned, which is equivalent to half the minimum wages in Brazil. And a high, uh, a considerable percentage of the population was classified as underused, as not uh, working many hours, as many hours per day as it is expected. So for these reasons, we wanted to investigate whether uh, the fact that people have no or, or low job stability and low income would influence in compliance, non-compliance with social distancing. So we wanted to investigate uh, whether having low income would be a factor that would impede people with complying with social distancing. Okay, another factor investigated was intolerance of uncertainty. So intolerance of uncertainty is defined as the inability to withstand aversive responses, which are triggered by the perception of uncertainty and lack of information. 
So the pandemic is a really uncertain period of time. We don't know when it's going to end, when there's going to be a vaccine to, to solve and stop the pandemic, stop the virus from spreading so rapidly as it is happening right now. So some people may have um, a tendency to not deal so well with uncertainty. And these people could be more prone, have a higher, a stronger tendency to not comply with social distancing trying to resume the activities that they performed before the pandemic to uh, to pretend that everything is back to normal since they cannot deal with uncertainty okay and intolerance of uncertainty is related with um, excessive worry and a state of anxiety and it's also associated with anxiety pathologies so this is another factor involved and that was also investigated was um, has to do with social identity theory so the social identity theory um, states that we categorize ourselves in groups so besides having a personal identity we also have a social identity which depends on the groups we belong to so this group group can be as simple as family or relatives in any groups that we belong to. So um, these groups, they influence uh, our values and the norms that we tend to comply with. They guide our thoughts and also our behaviors. And one theory that considered the existence of uh, social identity is the theory of planned behavior. So this theory investigates in some factors that influence intentions which ultimately influence behavior. So the three factors are attitudes, which are basically opinions on any type of subject, subjective norms or norms, social norms, and perceived behavioral control. So for example, an attitude towards social distancing could be positive or negative. If I think that social distancing is necessary, if that is it's, it's effective, then I will have a positive opinion a positive attitude on social distancing. If I think it's not necessary or it's not effective, I will probably have a negative um, opinion or attitude on social distancing. So the tendency is that if you have a positive attitude, you will have more, a higher probability to have more positive intentions and a higher probability of engaging in the behavior. Okay. Another factor is the norms and they can be influenced by the groups people belong to, as I have mentioned. And the other one, the last one, is how you perceive yourself to be in control of the action, which is perceived behavioral control. Okay, so now talking about the method. Um, so we had uh, over 2,000 participants in the research. It was all conducted online. We had participants from 25 of 27 federative units, uh, especially concentrated in Sao Paulo in the federal district. The age ranged from 18 to 88 years old. So as, in, as I have mentioned, it was conducted during the pandemic in late March, early April. So we found out that right-wing supporters tended to have a tendency to have weaker positive attitudes towards social distancing. So they, have, they tended to have negative, more negative attitudes if compared to um, left-wing supporters. They also had stronger intentions of violating social distancing. And they, uh, I also asked about their position on the president's opinion that people should go back to work and they had a tendency to have a stronger positive attitudes in, uh, towards this opinion. Okay, so they tended to support this opinion. So this could be explained by the fact that partisanship shapes political judgments. So it could be influenced by motivated reasoning, which is a bias to confirm uh, pre-existing beliefs and to evaluate some evidence they have access to with partiality. So since people, uh, they, they belong, these people belong to a group of right-wing supporters, they tend to find evidence to just justificate the position of their own group. Okay? So this is, this is a bias, and this um, 
our results support that uh, this bias that and support that political partisanship indeed played a factor in non-compliance with social distancing. Okay, another, so as to income, we didn't find a, an effect of income in attitudes or social distancing, but we found significant effects of income on intentions of violating social distancing and also on the president's statement. So uh, the lower the income, the higher the intentions of violating social distancing. And the higher the income, the higher the support to the pre president's statement. So we can find an effect of income here, clear effect of, effect of income. So people who have low income or low job stability, they may not have the choice to just stay at home and comply with social distancing because they don't have job security. They probably don't have any savings. They have no means to just stop working and stay, stay home. So this, re this result uh, provides evidence to uh, the relevance of cash transference. So, and then this is an evidence to support policies that promote cash transfers amid the pandemic. Uh, so as to intolerance of uncertainty, these people, they had a stronger tendency to violate social distancing as well. And uh, po public policies should also provide psychological support to help people deal with uncertainty because this could also uh, increase compliance with social distancing. It's a difficult time, especially hard for people who have some type of psychological disorder. So it is essential to provide psychological support to everybody who is having a difficult time in, in dealing with uh, complying with social distancing. Okay, um, so we, we found out that attitudes, that is opinions that people have on social distancing were the strongest predictor of intentions of violating social distancing. We also found out that um, as to norms, uh, when the norms were used, people in general, as reference, they didn't have a significant effect on intentions. But when the norms were used um, in groups ref uh, as reference, such as friends and family, this had had a significant effect on intentions of, of complying with social distancing. So to finish, um, we suggest that public policy should focus on perceptions, norms, and detrimental consequences uh, of non-compliance with social distancing applied to in-group members, uh, family, friends, or any other kind of group. Because uh, if the, we have found out that considering these type of groups, uh, is uh, elicits compliance in a stronger way than just mentioning people in general. Okay. So I thank you all for your attention and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, uh, Jessica for your presentation. Now we are going to show you again the uh, statistics. So you have a couple of minutes to fill in before we go to the discussion. Thank you all. Uh, I think now we could bring 
uh, the video of uh, Professor Suzanne and Jessica together with me here for the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I would like to to remind the our friends that are watching watching the the uh, the event uh, that they can use the chat to uh, to make questions and uh, directly the questions could be general for for both speakers or or could be uh, directed to a single speaker. I will start uh, myself with uh, with with some questions. The first is more to Professor Susan. I understand that. Uh, the presentations here, Professor Suzanne presented more from the point of view of Europe, uh, of, of Germany, uh, I would say Germany in general. Uh, I would ask you whether, if there are scientific evidence that uh, countries or communities that are seeking sustainable development are doing or do better regarding public health. So if I mean I mean scientific uh, scientific evidence. I don't know if you have that. It's just a, a general question. But uh, my point is that uh, there are places like Germany, for example, that. that uh, which is a country that is mature enough uh, to to take care of many issues related to the to 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 sustainable development, whereas in Brazil here we have a lot of deficiencies, uh, and we cannot deal with that yet. Uh, we will have to to have much more help of the government. Than, than you do. There are people who are more educated uh, and they can follow, for example, some of the, uh, when you put the, the uh, Bristol University tips, for example, uh, asking for people not to be poor, poor, for example, and many other things. Uh, here in Brazil, we have uh, the, the person, uh, him or herself, Cannot cho cannot choose not to be poor yet. Uh, it, we need much more. We need much more uh, help of the government, or maybe, or maybe we need more education for people to vote correctly. But we are we are far back uh, for for uh, for a, a significant part of the population. I would like to hear your analysis of this provocation. Oh, these are big questions. So first of all. I do not think the the, the uh, basic notes uh, from pu um, public health so is only focused on Germany. These things are worldwide the same, and 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 the the uh, so the basic needs for health, peace, shelter, food, and stuff like that. This is where, where, where it's needed everywhere. And, and and this is also why why the WHO and 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 so on and the UN all, already say these are the basic requirements. So this is not the uh, the future from from Germany. When it comes to um, sustainable development, even though I would say in Germany it chooses to be a poor object, even children who have um, a poor education. They already, uh, they still need a lot of support from from the uh, from the society or It's not my one. Who, who, there's not no one in, uh, working here. Not not in my office. Yes. 
Yeah, thank you. So, so uh, uh, also in Germany, no one chooses to 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 be poor or to be less educated, and there is lots of social support and and political support to get these things changed. And when it comes to sustainable development, is there any data that those who are better uh, have a better sustainable uh, development and they have less corona? Of course, this is a bit difficult to say, and, and the, the data are not here already, because first of all, you have to say, how do you define sustainable de development, to be honest, to say, okay, they are better developed. Uh, but we know that when, when, when you have more green environments, we know from our research, even here from Essen, we know the higher the amount of green just in front of the doors or the, out of the view of your window, if you have greens around you, you have less mental health problems. Uh, you know, when, when there is less uh, noise, we, we know that people have less um, high blood pressure and they, they also have a better health, uh, mental health condition. So these are and, and biodiversity, all these things uh, might be better developed in, in Germany, of course, because we have a, a lower part of, of uh, less educated people. But if you look in Brazil, you still might say, okay, we, we, we are less developed. But, but taking these basic things, you see, you have to go in the neighborhoods. Don't look too much in the whole broad thing, but go into the neighborhoods, try to get their very good social networks, try to make the, the, the people self-evident and try to empower themselves and try to let them participate to develop their own neighborhood. And these are small things uh, which are, from scientific view, already very effective. It helps the people to, to also organize their own, uh, own, own, own life. And so um, it's not always that Germany is better developed. We have lots of uh, areas with the low uh, developed uh, um, areas where we have to work a lot, a lot, a lot. And also we have lots of difficulties when it comes to uh, sustainable development. You know that our CO2 uh, export and so on, far too high. So these basic things I've shown you, I think you can take that in each other country and try to figure out how is this in my country. This is why I like this more general uh, view, because every, every country can take it for its own and develop from his side without looking, oh, they are much better and they are not better than me. This doesn't help country so far. Does it answer your question? Okay. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Maybe there was some misinterpretation uh, of some of the things you showed. I, now I, now it's, it's uh, for me at least, it's better explained. There are two other questions for Professor Suzanne, but I, I'll switch to Jessica first and then I'll come back to the to the questions uh, to Professor Susan. Okay, uh, you, uh, Jessica, you you talked about anxiety, right? Uh, yeah. Anxiety can lead to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, can lead to a decrease in health, right? And anxiety can. Uh, change, for example, melatonin and you, you, you decrease your health if you, if you have problems with that. So this is, we are talking more or less about stress. And then uh, you, you talked about right wing and left wing. So this, this people uh, would have more or less stress. Supposedly, uh, people that did, did not, that people that were not infected with coronavirus are not yet under stress because they don't know what the what the problem is until they get it. So people on the right wing would would have, or do you have any evidence that these people on the right wing that was let that were supposedly less stressed than the people on the left wing that accepted the rules and are worried with the with the COVID nineteen. Uh, do you expect or, or do we have any data on, uh, on the decrease in health of these people 
that supports the left wing in relation to the right wing. Okay, so let me see if I understood your question. So you are asking me whether uh, people who are left-wing supporters, they are more stressed than people who are right-wing supporters because left-wing supporters... I am assuming they, that. I don't know. I'm assuming pro. that, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. That more people on the left... Should... Yeah, actually, Stressed I have... by the pandemic. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah, actually, uh, I have no data about that. Uh, I have collected the data on some variables but I have analyzed the variables separately. So I didn't, um, I didn't evaluate the, the role of intolerance of uncertainty, which is not the same as anxiety. It's a, it's a related concept. So people mm -hmm. who have high intolerance of uncertainty, they tend to have higher anxiety levels as well, but it's not the same thing. So um, and intolerance of uncertainty is this inability to deal well with um, uncertain situations and so it's not exactly the same thing so what we have found out is that both variables they play a role in compliance or non-compliance with social distancing and but we haven't investigated the inter interaction effect so and so what we have found out was that the two variables had played a role in, in compliance. So I, I, we can assume that uh, since left-wing supporters uh, were more prone to comply with social di distancing, that they may have lower levels of intolerance of uncertainty. Okay? Actually, yeah, actually higher levels because they were more they, they tended to deal better with uncertainty and not violate social distancing in the context of the pandemic. But it's an assumption. Uh, I haven't actually tested that in my research. I haven't investigated the interaction between the two variables. But it's an assumption that could be, that could be tested. Okay, it makes sense since we have found uh, the results for these two variables that since they comply more with social distancing, they might have a uh, higher levels of tolerance of uncertainty while right-wing supporters which tended to comply less with social distancing could have uh, lower levels of intolerance of uncertainty there is a, a, a follow-up question uh, before I, I switch back to suzanne uh, that uh, is a question that is there there's who, who, were there any indicators for a strong link between for a strong link between weak social policies and strong anxiety? Did this enter in any way the research? I'm, I'm, I'm asking that before switching because this is a follow-up question of, of my question. Okay, uh, actually, um, uh, I didn't investigate uh, the role of public policies. I investigated the, the variables that could have an effect on compliance or violation or of social distancing and then based on our findings we have suggested some policies that could use our data as support to uh, as, a, as a backup to explain and justificate why uh, public policies should uh, consider the role of income the role of uh, intolerance of uncertainty and also of uh, political affiliation. So in this research, I didn't investigate the, the current public policies and how they affect uh, how they affect how people comply with social distancing, distancing or any other variable. But as I mentioned, I investigated those variables and to see whether they could affect compliance and Based on the results, then we suggested so that public policy should consider these factors. Thank you, Jessica. Well, the question, the the, the question for Suzanne that is there as well, is uh, uh, whether you you could comment on concrete numbers of how social inequalities have affected the COVID nineteen dissemination and deaths in Germany, assuming that you have this difference that you mentioned uh, before. If how how this affected the, uh, the COVID nineteen, and uh, I will also uh, uh, ask you uh, you both uh, 
you, you hold the question for, for later, Jessica, whether you have investigated uh, whether the social distancing uh, really have had an effect uh, if you consider the, the, the countries that are being studied and producing data. I, I did some investigation myself and I couldn't find any correlation. Uh, which means I investigated 56 uh, countries and uh, I, I didn't find uh, really a good correlation between the testing and, uh, and, the, and the number of cases in the populations, considering the size of the population and considering the population density as well. I, did, I, find, I found a correlation that's very, very low. And I couldn't see, I, I don't have numbers for that, I don't know if you have, uh, uh, numbers uh, on on the on the social distances of the different countries. So it's a curiosity whether you have that in the regions of your countries or if you have that for the whole world. And I think this is also related to the numbers that uh, uh, the question is the question is asking. Uh, so I I I start with the numbers showing some uh, association between. Uh, Social or the social inequality, and there is one. Uh, there, there are not much data right now, to be honest, because in the uh, in the very beginning, everyone was looking at how much are infected, uh, who is it who is infected, and not by social things, but more more morbidity and age and stuff like that. And 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 these were the more, the most fo the, the 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 real focus. Everyone was also concentrated on modeling. The ongoing on the infection disease, and now the few studies are coming out, also trying to figure out what uh, do we see the effects on social inequality and stuff like that. And my colleague from Düsseldorf, Nico Dragano, he made one um, interesting analysis. He took uh, data from health insurances. You know, and in Germany, everyone is almost everyone is in health insured. And he took the health insurance data where he had data from 1.3 million, um, from one health insurance with 1.3 million uh, members. And there were also data inside with unemployment, long term unemployment, and so on. And he just makes an association and could show uh, compared to those who are working, who have work, those who are unemployed, and even those who are long-term unemployed, they do have a higher chance from 20% or, uh, or even 70% higher chance to be infected or hospitalized, hospitalized with the virus, so also, which is meant that, he had, that this is a severe uh, uh, infection. They had a 70% higher chance. So, and, and, and being uh, unemployed is one of the factors uh, for low socioeconomic status. It's not it's a bill. Uh, it's a, uh, so it's the economy, and we know if you're unemployed, you have a higher risk of getting sick. And we see that here. And of course, there is a and, and it's there is no difference between men and women. They they, they both have the same chance to get sick of virus and heavily sick of this virus. So these are the first numbers that I have seen so far. Probably there are also already some more on the way. In the very beginning, it was also more or less distributed. This is the feeling we have, and we right now are testing that, or colleagues of mine, that there was not much of a social gradient because we didn't know much about this infected disease. But when the times goes on and on, we see now this it, it's more that there is going to be now a separation. So more people from the lower socioeconomic status are getting sick, whereas the those who have a higher status, the the numbers are, are not that high. And there are all kinds of discussion why this is. And coming to the refugee uh, refugee, uh, refugees, we see interesting in Germany. There is of course they have a special social. Um, Life. It's interesting. There are not real hotspots right now, but overall in Germany the numbers are not that high as in Brazil. That is why it's also difficult to get really evidence-based data. 
Okay, just to uh, to let you know that I, I did an investigation in Sao Paulo and we found that uh, uh, the level of education uh, in the city is, is quite important. Uh, we find, if you look at the number of cases, um, of the number of deaths, then divided by the number of cases in different regions of the city, uh, the, the, the regions where we have a higher income, more or less similar to what uh, Jessica produced, but this higher income, we, we, we discovered that there's not a single the income, the income cannot be taken is, isolatedly. Uh, we have to look at several factors and we see that the income and education go together. Uh, whereas if you go to, to, the, to the regions where the uh, houses have deficiencies, then there's another problem. So there's a very much yeah. a public health uh, issue as well. So the question, the question of the refugees uh, is on that because the refugees supposedly would have a I, I don't know. I don't know anything about uh, how things are going in Germany, but supposedly the refugees would have better housing conditions, uh, or 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 things like the. the do you do, would you say so, or or when the refugees get there, they get all the the standard no, that no, the Germans no, no, have. No, no, they don't have the same standards. So they are also in closed homes. They are they are put together when, especially in the very beginning, and they are in closed. Uh, 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 close community, gap communities. So everyone was waiting that they mm -hmm. ha that we have hot spots there because they're close together. They have not much space. They have they are living with lots of people in one room and so on and so on. So perfect uh, ways to get hot spots. But of course there were people that were infected, but not that impressive like in other like in in. In, in some kind of industry where they're making this meat things and, and, and slaughteries and so they had we had much uh, worse uh, cases of hotspots. Okay, so my question, uh, the question number four uh, is more or less what I just asked you, right? Uh, okay, uh, uh, Jessica. Uh, uh, I, I just mentioned about this uh, connection between education and, uh, and the high income. Do, did you see that in your research? Uh, did you compare, because you, you just showed the right wing, I didn't see the left wing. Do, do, you, do you ask people, I didn't see the questions that you used in your questionnaire. Uh, did you ask people whether they were uh, left, right or middle? And uh, uh, what were the levels of education of these people? And uh, do you do you, have you gotten data related to the case, the the case, the whether they have acquired or not COVID nineteen things like this? Your mic, switch on your microphone, please, Jesse. So I asked people to state whether they were far right wing, uh, moderate right wings, or center and the same goes to uh, left wing. And so people stated their own pol political affiliation. And uh, what I found for left wing, was, left wing supporters was basically the opposite of what I found to uh, left wing supporters. So. Uh, while right-wing supporters tended to have a greater, ten greater tendency to violate social distancing, left-wing ones tended to have a greater tendency to respect it. Um, and I also asked about their um, educational level. Mm -hmm. But one thing that was very particular from my sample was that most people were highly educated. Um, so most people were either, they had either finished uh, the graduate degree or had or were uh, postgraduate students. So I didn't, I didn't have a, such a, um, did such a varied sample. So I didn't have uh, many people from many types of educational levels. So uh, my sample was concentrated. So, and I didn't find a, an effect of uh, education, but this could be the case because I didn't have um, 
such a varied sample. So I didn't have so many people who hadn't finished, uh, for example, elementary school or high school. Mm -hmm. Most of them have a, had already finished um, high school and actually they had at least undergraduate degree. So that's one of the things. One of the things that was good is that I had a really diverse, diversified sample when it comes to age, for example. I had people ranging from 18 to 88 years old, and this was probably because it was an online research. Usually my sample is not so diversified when it comes to age because I usually collect data at the university. And, but uh, when it comes to education, it was no, so, not so diversified. That could be one of the reasons why I didn't find any effect of education. But uh, well, in a sense, what you what the data is saying is that the the uh, the, the political approach of a person is more important than the education in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the social distancing, right? And they, exactly. if, if, if we have to assume that if social distancing, that was one, one question that I made before, if, if social distancing really makes a difference, uh, I think it does, but uh, if, if it's scientifically we could prove that it's, it makes a difference, the political, uh, the political statement or the political status is, is really very important. Uh, to determine whether uh, whether people will get uh, COVID nineteen or not, I think there's that. To me, it seems a very very important uh, conclusion. Right? Yeah, political partisanship was actually the most relevant factor when we analyzed the effect size. It had the strongest, the highest effect size, and the same has been found in other countries, as I mentioned in the United States and Canada. So. Um, there were some other research that were conducted in both countries, and they found similar 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 results that political partisanship was a determinant factor in compliance with such measures. Well, the question, the obvious questions to Suzanne. Uh, by the way, very nice mug, Suzanne. Uh, oh, your mug, one. your mug. That's very beautiful. Still yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> uh, the 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 same question could go for you whether in Germany. Uh, well, what uh, what Jessica is saying is that the political the, the politics interfered in the COVID nineteen here, and I I support this as well. I'm living here, and I I can say that this was really uh, very stressing during the pandemic. Did you have anything similar in Germany or around Europe that you have noticed? Uh, we don't have so nice uh, uh, service as Jessica has. Uh, uh, at least I'm not aware of that. Um, but I think also there is um, the politics, as you know, are quite different. We, we, we are happily right now, there are only a few of these kinds of presidents or people and the top of, of the society, like Trump or Bolsonaro, uh, there are only a few in Poland and, and some more or less far away from the view from Germany. So all the politics in Germany were very combined, they were very uh, collaborative. They worked together, and in that time, uh, the, the other parties didn't say anything. They just let the, 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 the politics or the government, it wasn't criticized by, by other kinds of parties. And, and the only one who, who started to criticize was the uh, right uh, wing party, AFD. And this is now, they, they had a very bad time, to be honest, because they couldn't say, oh, the, the refugees and this and that, they had no, way to say to, to contribute somehow but now they are starting to take the groups that are sick of the separation and lockdowns and stuff like that and they, they, they say there is no virus they take over and try to take this um, these people but these people are so diverse that I'm pretty sure that we wouldn't see any kind of association right now if they were left or right-winged uh, so this is more 
the, the, the society is mostly the society is clear. There is a virus. We have to take care. We have to separate to do the social distancing or this this uh, mask. And a small amount of people say no, we don't want to have that. But it's 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 not a big problem, although it seems to be a big problem because everyone is talking about them. But it's a small one. Uh, Susanna, I have another question for you. Uh, is that and until what point do you think the uh, there is a uh, the, the lockdowns uh, would provoke a ne negative feedback uh, to the effect uh, 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 negative feedback in the health of people in the public health uh, due to this the, the effects on the economy uh, we. Here in Brazil, for you to know, we have uh, we have some money flowing for the poorest people, and and this is sort of keeping a little bit the economy going up to now. We don't know whether we have enough money to to continue to do that. Uh, have you done that in Germany? I'm asking because you 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 make these correlations uh, uh, with the public health and the and and, and economy. And if the if the economy doesn't go well, then you can provoke a negative feedback uh, and and uh, and have more problems in the future. Also, uh, I think it's not time yet, but for the, the I think you are having now a second wave of of, uh, of the coronavirus. Uh, how do you see that? How do you attribute uh, the economy? The behavior, social distancing, with the with this with these issues. What do you see? What do you seek for the future as well? So, so um, let's see. Um, what was the first point? Was um, negative sorry, feedback in, so in the, in the health? We do probably similar to Brazil. Everyone gets kind of money, and and there is also another instrument what we call uh, short quotes side short term. Uh, so the, so people that are employed, and the the employee doesn't have enough uh, work for them and goes out for money. The 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 German um, government gives to this employees money to say so you can pay. Your employees, your employers, no, your, your employers, mm -hmm. and uh, give them money for shortcuts working. So they are working not 40 hours a week, but only 20 or 10. But still, they get money for that. Uh, so they try to keep the economy uh, running. They try to keep them in their jobs because they know the jobs are mostly important for them to pay their rents and everything and also to stay healthy. And they just yesterday decided to prolong prolong that for another year. So this is one of these instruments try to uh, make a buffer that the, 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 the shock is not too big. Uh, but we will see how this develops in the future because, you know, this is very complex. And of course, if the economy drops down, then of course we will have we will see lots of kinds of health uh, 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 effects. As I said, if you are unemployed, you have a high risk to get sick from all kinds of diseases. So this is also why the German mm -hmm. uh, government tries to support the system as long as possible. And uh, so in Germany, we 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 do have a good health insurance and also an insurance when you get unemployed you at least you get some money to have a basic income income in so so in, in your in your opinion this this policy is correct of uh, giving money to people keeping the jobs in terms of yeah. uh, public health yeah although of course you know always there is a discussion do you do uh, um, is this the right way? But however, they are doing something for the people, and 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 uh, so far, I guess they are happy to, to have at least a job and not to be unemployed. I think this is one of the most important things for the people. 
o que uh, uh, Jessica. Uh, I don't know if you can talk anything about uh, uh, social psycho social psychology, the behavior of uh, people, because we we already came to the conclusion that the uh, politics here seem seem to, seems to be quite important during seems to have been important during the pandemic but there is also an issue that is the uh, social the social behavior the, the social psychology behavior that people imitate other people and the media as well how do you see that do you, do you, have you evaluated the media effect or in any way because one of one of your slides has the public opinion there mm -hmm. yeah actually uh, this is called social influence and we evaluated the role of people who are important to the participants. So we evaluated the effect of the groups people participate in. More importantly, um, family and friends. So uh, social psychology studies uh, uh, people, people's behavior in society. It's different from, for example, clinical psychology, mm -hmm. which is aimed at diagnosing psychological disorders and treating people individually. So social psychology is more concerned about problems that affect people in a society. So in, in, my, in my research, in this research, I didn't investigate the role of the media, but the role of the groups people participate in. And as I mentioned, people are influenced by groups. They are influenced by people that are relevant to them. So while um, it was not significant, the fact that people in general, people, they, participants didn't know, um, it was not important what they thought uh, about social distancing. It was not a relevant thing. But when we evaluated the role of what their friends, what their relatives thought about social distancing, it had a significant effect. So in general, people um, are affected by uh, what their group thinks, what their group, how their group behaves, and what their group does. So, and this is exactly one of the explanations why political partisanship is a factor that influences social distancing compliance. So people are belong to the same group as their partisans. So. If you identify yourself as a uh, right wing, then all the right wings are automatically in the same group as you are. And if all the right wings think that it's not important to comply with social distancing, that it doesn't work, that it's not effective, then you tend to conform and to Thank you, Jessica. Uh, one last question to Suzanne uh, is, uh, how do you see the role of uh, the environment in the public health there, considering this uh, framework of the COVID-19, but also from the perspective of the global climate change? Uh, the, uh, how, what's your, what's your op opinion about that? And, did, 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 do you think there there was any effect of the environment? Yes, in all I, I only th I, I not only think. I guess we will see. We already have some data where we see that in Germany, for instance, we know that we have a CO two reduction now. We we had a limit, and and this time we will reach this limit and don't go over this limit, but only because of COVID. Otherwise, we had we couldn't uh, make that. And this is already for sure. And what is interesting, we, we have some um, sound measurements in one of the cities here in the rural area, Bochum, and we measured in in 700 different places. And, and we could see, which is very interesting, that the, the, the level of noise reduced by more than four decibels, which doesn't sound much, 
but when it comes to listening, it's more than uh, a, a half the loudness than in normal times. And uh, I guess everyone, I don't know how it was in Bra Brazil, but here you could hear the, the, the birds singing in the morning because there were no airplanes, so no air. Same here. Yeah, it the was same just, here. I think for, for a lot of people, it was a perfect time when it comes to the environment because no uh, less or less cars or almost no cars, no airplanes with lots of uh, noise. And you suddenly could listen yep. to a soundscape or the, the sound of your city, which is very interesting. And this we already we see. And of course, when it comes to the environment from the pollution, of course, we've seen reduction in uh, CO2 and uh, fine particulate matter and stuff like that. Unfortunately, it's only because of the lockdown and we don't want to have a lockdown. But 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 you can see you can reach uh, so there, there are also lots of positive effects if you have less cars and less airplanes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I I thought you were going to talk about the sound, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is one of, one of the studies yeah, that you do, right? Uh, you, I don't know if you know there is a study that the whales, uh, I mean the the sound the sound of yeah. the boats in the sea. Changed the changed the behavior of the whales. So ima imagine the. the Hello, I'm here. Okay, yeah, nice. It was a very good, a nice uh, closing. So thank you very much, uh, Marcus. Uh, thank you very much, also Professor Susanne Mirbos and Jessica Farias. Your presentation was very interesting, and discussing was uh, rich as well. So it was uh, nice uh, questions and discussion. Uh, very, very, very rich. So, living on the planet in this era is indeed uh, a challenge. Some days ago, director of the World Health Organization, Tedros Adhanom, announced that uh, we need to be prepared to live with COVID-19 for more two years, until 2022. However, humanity doesn't want to live so long on provisory models, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm reading here. So humanity doesn't want to live uh, so long on provisory models. People, society, structures need to be adapted to what is being called the new normal. This will be the approach of our third February half from Paul online talk that will be held in almost two weeks. On Monday, 14 September, our meeting will face the third subtopic of our online talk series, Shaping the Future. I can confirm the psychiatrist and professor Daniel de Barros from the University of Sao Paulo as one of our speakers. He is well known due to his interviews on television about social behavior as well as his performance on social networks. Professor Marcelo Pereira, a Brazilian researcher as well, is going to be our second speaker. Pereira will represent the German science. He is professor since long time ago at the University of Münster. He will speak about long-term change, changes in the educational, educational systems. To follow the agenda of our online talk series and the activities of the Day Hat São Paulo, Please write down or take a picture of this slide with our website address and social media. This online talk was recorded and the video will be available soon on our channel on YouTube as well through our social media. Before we close this transmission, I'm going to ask you once more to answer our last survey informing us some anonymous information about your profile and your evaluation of the second DV Hats on Polo online talk. The questions will be open for two minutes. After this time, this transmission will be ended. I thank you all for participating. Have a nice day.